Morning, brothers and sisters. Good morning, everyone. It's a good day to march to the Seattle Center. Um, the other day, my daughter uh, asked me a question. Uh, asked me a question. If I don't become a doctor or lawyer, am I a failure? I don't know if you heard about that. I said, uh, why do you say that? Um, she said, that all my friends say that Asian parents do this. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, then I said, oh no, that's uh, old fashioned. My dad used to do that, <laughs> but not anymore. Uh, reminds me, uh, uh, I learned the material science and the engineering, so because my dad told me to do so. Now I realize I never loved that. So now I opened my own business, I love it. So the choice is really important. Uh, the kids here in America, they have lots of free things do whatever they want. But I told my daughter, you have to do it legally, yeah? follow the law. Mm -hmm. So here in Bible, in John chapter 12, verse 35, Jesus said, you are going to have the light just a little while longer. Walk while you have the light before darkness overtakes you. Whoever walks in the dark does not know where they are going. So this reminds us the choice and the effort. Um, so uh, now I feel that choice are a little bit more important than efforts. Right? But when we were young, uh, parents told us to work hard. Efforts is more important. But here you see, we were in the darkness. If we choose to stay in darkness, that's our destiny. Right? We never come out. So we make choice to follow the light, to follow Jesus, and we Christian. We, we come here every Sunday to worship God. Amen. Let's, let's stand up. Let's sing the song. Here I'm to worship.
Good morning. The, the weather outside is frightful. <laughs> we uh, were a little surprised this morning to see the snow. And uh, I should have known because Glenn told me. He said it's going to snow on Sunday. And <laughs> I, I, was, I, said, I, said, I, I, I was hoping you were wrong. But anyway, here we are, and we arrived safely. And uh, you're a good-looking bunch. Glad to have you this morning in church. Let's look to God in prayer, and as we do so, are there any special requests for prayer this morning? My brother got a yeah, and uh, we mentioned that in Sunday school that the flu is nothing to mess with. And uh, occasionally we'll hear of people, you know, I think of the flu as a day or two of not feeling well. And there are some people who have sustained situations. And we'll keep it. What's his name? Andy. Andy. And uh, again, uh, my sister Judy, who is still... Um, in her healing process, having undergone a, a very serious fall down the flight of stairs, and uh, she she's making progress, but it's it's very slow. Anything else? Any other special request? Let's go to God in prayer. We're thankful this morning, our Father, that we are able to come to you and to cry out, Abba, Father, to know that as your beloved children, we can approach your throne with boldness, we can come with confidence, but we can also come with that familiarity that a child would have approaching a loving father. And we're thankful for that this morning. Help us as we pray, as we come into your presence to realize who you are and to understand in a better way who it is that we are in your sight. We live in a world where there are those that are casual acquaintances. There are others that are intimate friends and close relations. But there's no one that loves us like Jesus. And this morning as we look into your word, we're going to see the reality of that love. That greater love has no man than this, that a man lays down his life for his friends. And yet while we were still sinners, Christ laid down his life. Christ died for us. This is the message of the gospel. This is our only hope as those who have offended a holy God. We are thankful that you reached out to us because in our condition, we never would have reached out to you. Bless your word this morning. As we're gathered together, might we hear your voice? Might we see these examples of your love as they're conveyed in your word? And might we respond to the glorious message of the gospel. These special requests that have come before us, we pray for Andy, who's dealing with a, a severe case of the flu. We pray once again for Judy McCoy, who is recovering from an injury uh, sustained by a fall. Uh, we pray, Father, for others that we know of that are grieving. We think of our friend and, and sister who has just lost a nephew at the age of seven to cancer. And we pray, our God, that you would bless that family as they struggle with, with what they knew was coming. And yet uh, today, uh, the reality has struck home. And we pray that you'll comfort their hearts. Jesus said, blessed are those that mourn, those that grieve for they shall be comforted, and we pray for nearness to this family at this time. Keep us safe today. 
strong and healthy and of sound mind be with us as we travel. Uh, some of us have distances to go home. There are others that are traveling on vacation and are away from us. And we miss them and we ask for our God to be a portion to them where they are. And Father, once again as we've gathered together, we ask you that the one who has promised to be where two or three are gathered in his name, we pray, our God, we would have a sense of his presence this morning and that we would go away from here with others recognizing that we have been with Jesus. So we look to you and we call upon your name and pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I know I say this every week, but we're working our way through the Gospel of Mark. Um, there are things that need to be repeated. We are, we are in the final chapters of Mark, the smallest, the shortest of the Gospels. I, I have my opinion about that. You've heard that before, that Mark, who as a second generation believer, raised up in a Christian home, his mother, Mary, lived on the edge of Jerusalem, she was the one whose house was conducting an overnight, an all-night prayer vigil for Peter, who was in prison. And you remember the story? Peter was released by an angel of the Lord, and as he came to that house, there was a prayer meeting going on. And Mark is mentioned there in the book of Acts, chapter 12. And um, he came to know the Lord, the, the influence of a Christian family, and I, I hope that our young people here today that are born and raised up under the sound of the Word of God and the Gospel appreciate moms and dads that brought you to church, uh, insisted on your attendance at Sunday school, uh, prayed at the table, giving thanks to the Lord for the blessings of nutrition and health and what the world takes so for granted. Uh, and the sense of God's presence within the home. And for our parents, excuse me, our parents here today, uh, remember the influence that you have upon these little ones. And although they learn much in church, the responsibility is that which takes place in the home as they sit under the sound of the word and experience the righteousness of godly parents being raised in such a scriptural and such a holy atmosphere. I want to remind you of that this morning. We are in Mark chapter 15. I have numerous scriptures to look at. Our subject, and in fact our title is sentenced without a conviction. And if you've watched television programs that involve police action and those that are arrested in violation of the law, uh, we're familiar with the course of events that take place, the arraignment where a person faces their charges and stands before a judge and it's established with clarity why they are there and the offenses that have happened in the regard of the law and what they have done, what they have broken, what they have done contrary to the law of the land. Uh, there is a whole lot that goes on uh, that leads up to a trial and in the trial, that individual has those who represent them, or perhaps they represent themselves. And the purpose of the trial is to establish the truth. And when an individual faced with the truth finds themselves in the position of guilty, uh, then there is a next step that has to do with the payment, the sentence for that offended law for that crime that was committed. And the interesting thing that we have in the regard of Jesus, although there were those that brought charges and accusations against him, 
they were done and they were given without any without any witnesses there to uh, the stories that and the charges, the allegations against him uh, were not backed up by anyone else who could affirm that indeed he had done these things. And interestingly, uh, many of the things that he was accused of were true of him uh, because of who he is. Uh, he was accused of uh, claiming uh, the, the rightful uh, position, uh, the rightful claim of being the son of God and other things that they alleged about him. And uh, wonderfully, uh, in the courts of the land and in the courts, really, of the world, uh, we, we have an innocent victim standing before a judicial system that, as you read these portions of Scripture, they were so out of line. Uh, I know that today we watch the news and we see some things going on in the courts of the land that perhaps we don't agree with or we see things taking place that are out of line with the procedures and the protocol of the law and of the legal system. Well, this is the worst. This is the Holy Son of God standing before, I, I was going to say unrighteous or unholy, but I, I'm going to say it like this, standing before wicked men. And wonderfully, uh, and they didn't know what they were doing, but wonderfully, what was taking place behind the scenes is God was moving Jesus into the position where by these accusations and by this wrongful treatment of humanity, Jesus ends up on a cross. The Roman, the Roman form of, of the death penalty, uh, this, this capital crime that he was accused of, but never, never found to be guilty of anything. In fact, we're going to be reading today that the judge, who was a high official, said, I find no fault in him. I find nothing in him at all. And in fact, three times he makes that statement but nevertheless, Jesus is led forth and led outside, bearing his cross, and ultimately and finally suffers, bleeds, and dies at Calvary. And wonderfully today, as we're sitting here, we can say personally that we believe it was for us. He died and suffered there. The scripture says Christ died for our sins. I, I hope that today you can say that personally, recognizing that it was your sins. I, I hope that you can say from your heart this morning, Jesus died for me. It is what God has done for us that brings salvation, that takes us from the position of violators, takes us from the position of guilty before God and brings us into a position of acceptance in the Father's love. Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ dying for our sins, our sins being forgiven through that wonderful act of atonement. We'll explain that as we go along. But today we are, the Bible says, accepted. We are accepted in the Beloved, in the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us has made this all possible. I hope that today you pay special attention because we are going to emphasize the message, the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. I hope that there are those in our service this morning that come to faith in Christ. Come in your understanding of what we're looking at and acknowledging it personally and being able to say from your heart, Jesus died for me. This idea of a substitute, of a sacrifice being made in payment for the offenses, for the sins, the guilty party, that they might escape judgment 
that they might experience fullness as far as a settlement with the with the law goes goes way back to the beginning. Uh, in fact, uh, the first time that you'll see this alluded to is in Genesis chapter three. Uh, there we have read about uh, God's creation and the days in which God said, "Let there be." And by the word of his mouth and by the power of his word, he created all things. Uh, but then he took on a special project. And out of the dust of the ground, out of the, I'm going to say, clay of this earth, he fashioned a man in his own image and in his own likeness. And you've likely sat in Sunday school class and you'd say, well, that was our first father uh, whose name was Adam. And I know that in the world today there are all kinds of so-called scientific theories about how we got here and who we are. But wonderfully, and, and I go back to the, the trial of the century, the last century, uh, where there was a man who, whose face occupied the television screens for many, many days. And uh, his name was O.J. And uh, he was accused of of murder, uh, that trial turned out uh, as, a, as a, a tragedy from the standpoint of justice because there was so much that took place that was not fair, uh, that was not according to the issues of right and wrong. And we all have our, those of us that are familiar with that story, we have our opinions of it and so forth. But at that time, uh, there was a question regarding uh, blood at the scene of the crime and particularly that having to do with a glove. And you'll remember that there was an individual who stood up with the uh, glove that was blood stained and he said as he tried to put it on his hand, if it does not fit, then you must acquit. And uh, there was so many things that it really became, it really became kind of a, kind of a clown show, as to some of the things that took place in that trial. But they concluded that the match of the blood at the scene and on the glove and in the white bronco and different other places, by the use of what we know today commonly as. DNA, uh, it was a perfect match. And there was a question as to how accurate is this, and they said that the match is so perfect because there's no one else that would or could have such, uh, such a match of the genetic components. And there was a statement made, and it was on the front page of USA Today, uh, that you could take the genetic uh, maze, all of the components of uh, an individual's genes, and you could trace each person back to, they even said, an original parent. And I thought, oh my. So you're saying that you could unravel this genetic pattern and come back to its origin and they were, were talking in those terms and the thought went through my mind I know the guy's name and we have it in Genesis uh, his name was Adam the father of us all his wife's name was Eve she was fashioned and formed out of components that God took from Adam and Adam and Eve were the first mother and father pair, the first parents on planet Earth. And uh, God placed them in an ideal situation. He put them in a place where every desire of their heart was satisfied. You and I struggle because of things that we deal with in life that are far from perfect, that was not the case with Adam and Eve. They lived in a perfect environment. Sin had not yet entered into the world and it came about
by their disobedience to one seemingly insignificant, seemingly small rule uh, having to do with the partaking, having to do with the eating of a piece of fruit. And you may say, well, that seems a little too simple. That, that doesn't seem to me to be such a big thing, but it was in disobedience to the word of God and it was in rebellion to God's holy character. And Adam and Eve fell. Here they were in a condition where they could live their lives openly in the presence of the Lord. And as God came into the garden in the cool of the day, they enjoyed his presence and fellowship with him until they disobeyed. And interestingly, and I might make someone blush a bit this morning, but the first thing that they noticed after their sin is that they were naked. And you're going like, oh, that's okay. Well, um, I think that figuratively, even, if you want to allegorize the story, they became aware of the fact that everything about them was I'm going to use these terms, naked and open to the eye of God. They, they were unable to even cover the action, the sinful deed that they had done. And when God comes into the garden after that, they hid from him. And wonderfully, God, who is a God of grace and mercy, reached out to them and provided for them tunics or garments of skin that clothed their nakedness. The, the issue of, of sin and some of the things that we know about as the progression of this teaching goes on in the scripture were unknown to them, but they found themselves covered by the provision of God. And in order for that to happen, for them to be clothed in those skins an animal and we're not even given the detail of what kind of animal but an animal was slain and the skin of that animal was used to clothe Adam and Eve and they could say that as that animal was used having been provided for their covering uh, they could say of that animal it died for us that animal died Adam could say, for me. Eve could say, it died for me. It's a small picture of the gospel. And way back at the beginning of time, uh, here is a wonderful example in very simple terms of how you and I, by what Christ has done for us, are clothed and covered before God so that we can stand acceptable that we can stand in his presence in a way that is not offensive to a holy God. Uh, the next uh, story that I, I just want to allude to is found in Genesis chapter 22. And there's a whole lot to this story. Uh, as, the, as the gospel message progresses, and, and I'm so glad that God didn't give it to us all at once, but as it progresses, uh, we come in contact with a man whose name was Abram. We know him today uh, as Abraham. Uh, his name was changed by God. But uh, Abraham was a man who responded to the voice of the Lord. There's not a lot of detail given, but God spoke to him. And it says in chapter 15 of Genesis verse 6 that Abraham believed God and that was, I'm going to do this, that was accounted, that was put to his credit for righteousness. God was able to look at this man who was like anyone else. He was out of Ur of the Chaldees, present day Iraq. And he was, I suppose, like anyone else. And yet when God spoke to him, and God gave a promise to this man, Abraham said yes to God. Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him. It was put to his account as righteousness. Well, uh, 
Time went on. And in chapter 22 of Genesis, God commands Abraham to do what seems like an unthinkable act. Abraham had a little boy, according to the promise of God, whose name was Isaac. And it was through Isaac that the promise of God was going to be accomplished, was going to be fulfilled. And yet one day, God said to Abraham, take now your son, your only son, and offer him up to me as a burnt offering. And if that is a little shocking to you, I, I have to say, I suppose that that would shock anyone. And yet Abraham, in obedience... He gathered together the things that were necessary for him to fulfill God's command. And he and his boy, Isaac, they went up the mountainside with their servants. And at a particular point, Abraham and Isaac left them behind. And they continued up the mountainside. But they said, Abraham said to them, uh, you stay here while I and the lad go yonder, go off and worship and return again unto you. And Abraham once again believes the unbelievable and trusts in God and he takes Isaac and lays him upon an altar upon wood that he had provided himself and as he is preparing for the culmination of this action that God has commanded an angel of the Lord stops him, stops his hand from injuring, from, from destroying his son, who was the intention to be burned as a burnt offering. And wonderfully, Abraham looks into a bush, into a thicket, and there he sees a ram caught in the thicket by its horns, and Abraham offers that animal up in the place of his son. And wonderfully, the two of them come back down the mountainside and rejoin the servants. And our Bibles tell us in the book of Hebrews chapter 11, in that little section between verses 17 and 19, that in that, Abraham received Isaac alive in a figure of resurrection. And I, I'm fascinated by that because I guess it would be understood that from the beginning, Abraham believed that if I'm going to do this that God has commanded me to do, even though I burn my son to ashes, God is going to restore him to me. And Abraham, somehow, though there had never been a resurrection before his day, Abraham believed that God would reconstitute would give him back his son, though in obedience, he was going to burn him upon the altar. I, I'm, I'm fascinated by that. And I, I hope that this morning you are as well. That God, in the heart of Abraham, was, was so believed upon. Abraham's faith in God was so strong that something as impossible as bringing his son back to life Abraham said, no problem. I'm dealing with Almighty God. Well, uh, this morning as we talk about the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, as we are leading up to that day when he is led outside the city of Jerusalem to hang upon a Roman cross and to suffer, bleed, and die, we are looking at the God of the impossible. Because the word of God tells us, according to scripture, not only did Christ die for our sins and was buried, but according to scripture, he rose again from the dead. And there were those eyewitnesses that saw Jesus after that event had taken place. And they beheld the miracle of resurrection in the person of Jesus Christ. And I have to ask you this morning, do you believe? Are you willing to look at the impossible and to realize that another was able, another was called upon of God to die, to give his life, to lay himself down, if you will, upon a cross, which was God's altar, 
and to be lifted up to suffer, bleed, and die on account of your sins? Will you believe in that act of God where he gave his son in sacrifice for you? And will you believe that that same one who died upon the cross rose again from the dead and is a living Savior this morning that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. We want to make this direct. We want to make this clear. I want to make this convicting to you. Even though Jesus was sentenced without a conviction, have you been convicted by the death of Jesus upon the cross to where you realize it was for your sins? The hymn writer could say it was for my sins. He hung and suffered there. Let's turn to the scriptures that you have in your hand this morning and look at Matthew first before we get down to our designated reading. Matthew chapter 27, right at the top of the left-hand side of your page. And at that feast, this is the feast of Passover. And by the way, we are nearing that. Uh, we've only got a little while and we're going to celebrate Easter. Or as Elder Lai says, Resurrection Sunday. And in the process of that, we're going to have a Good Friday service. Uh, we're going to have a time here where we discuss the events that we're looking at here in the scripture today and Jesus being condemned by unrighteous and wicked men and being led to the place called Calvary where he gives his life as payment for our sins. At that feast, the Passover feast, the governor customarily released one prisoner whom they choose chose, rather, unto the crowd. And they had then a notorious prisoner named Barabbas. And if you look down, uh, you'll see in chapter 15, verse 1, that there was an insurrection, an uprising against the government. And in that act of insurrection, this Barabbas had committed murder. Um, when you come to the writing of Luke, uh, Barabbas is described as a thief who was involved in an insurrection. And then again in John as well. This guy was, he was, if you will, at the top of the list when it comes to those that were deserving of death. And yet Barabbas is the one that is chosen by the people of the street there in the nation of Israel. He's the one who is chosen to be set free, guilty as he was, notorious as his character had been known, he is released and Jesus is led away and crucified. Jesus is the one whose life is taken and what, what would Barabbas be able to say after all of this? He, he would be able to say, when somebody might see him out walking down the street, what's going on here? We were of the understanding that you had been caught, that you had been charged, that you had been convicted, that you had been sentenced to death, and here you are on your way to the normal activities of life and living. How do you explain this? And what, what would Barabbas say? He'd say, Jesus died for me. There was one who stood in my place. There was one who, and how much Barabbas knew about the innocence of Jesus, we're not sure at this time. But an innocent victim bore the guilt and the heinous charges that were leveled against Barabbas and died in his place. And I, I, I got to give you a little side note here. Um, I, I don't know a lot of the Bible language. Uh, I've, I've read the entire New Testament in Greek. Um, I don't know a lot of the Hebrew language. I do know this, that bar means the son. Okay, bar, and this man's name is bar Abbas. Abbas means father. Interestingly, this 
notorious criminal whose name means literally son of the father has one died in his place, a substitute, a sacrifice, give his life, who is the son of the father. I, I hope that, I hope that, I, I just hope that really kind of grabs your attention today and you realize what's taking place here all, all in the plan of things by an all-knowing God. When they were assembled together, verse 17, Pilate said to them, Whom do you wish that I release to you, Barabbas or Jesus called Christ? For he realized that Jesus had been delivered unto him out of envy. Just just a desire to do evil and wrong to this wonderful man that they had experienced and witnessed on their streets of whom they could find nothing to accuse him. But as he sat upon the judgment seat, his wife, that would be Pilate's wife, sent unto him saying, let nothing be done to you and that just man, for I suffered much today over a dream about him. But the chief priest and the elders convinced the people that they request Barabbas and destroy Jesus. When the governor responding said to them, which from the two do you wish that I released you? They cried out, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, what then should I do with Jesus, which is called the Christ? They all cried out, crucify, crucify him. The governor said, for what evil done? But they shouted, the more crucify. And Pilate, recognizing that nothing was gained, but instead an uproar occurred, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I'm innocent of the blood of this righteous man. See to it, or you will see. And all the people responded, if you can imagine this, his blood is on us. We will stand responsible for this action today. Don't you worry about a thing. You've washed your hands of it. That's where we get that idiom in our language today. I've washed my hands of this situation. Pilate had washed his hands and said, I'm innocent of the blood of this righteous man. And they said, his blood be on or his blood be upon us and upon our children. You know, the Bible speaks of the sin of the parents being met out against the children. And here are, you know, we would look at that and we would wonder, well, how is that? And is that even, is that right? These people are asking for it. They're saying his blood be upon us and upon our children. What, what a horrible frame of mind. What, what terrible wickedness. I, I was talking earlier this morning when we first opened our service about children of Christian parents and the influence of godly parents. Here are people that profess to be the people of God and they're, they're demanding that the blood of an innocent victim fall upon, that the blame fall upon them and upon their children. Then he released Barabbas to them, but having Jesus scourged, he delivered him to be crucified. I need to explain this thing of scourging. Uh, some of you have seen the movie, uh, The, uh, the uh, Passion of the Christ. And uh, I, I came away from that movie quite speechless. Uh, I went on the, the first showing of it uh, in Battle Creek and as I was there, there were many other pastors also that wanted to see it. And uh, I, I have to be honest with you, it was almost more than I could bear. And as I was coming out, I said to one of my friends who was also at the showing, well, what did you think? And he just did this. And he had tears running down his face and he just couldn't even talk. The scourging, uh, the whipping of the Lord Jesus in that particular movie, and I, I think 
in reality it was overdone, but I mean, because there was a limit to how much they could lay upon a person. But this was a purpose for the purpose of beating an accusation or beating an admission, beating a confession out of the accused because there was there was no legitimate charge against Jesus. So he delivered Jesus to be scourged. Let's go down to Mark. And um, again, you'll see in verse 10 and in verse 11, some of the very same words that we read in Matthew. And very likely, Mark received much of his information from the other disciples, those that were there with Jesus to see what had happened. And so it's not... Uh, unusual, don't say, well, this looks like plagiarism, not by any means. Uh, these are the notations that Mark took so that he would have stories regarding Jesus. He was a young evangelist, and because he was not there, he needs to make certain that he has the accounts accurate in the regard of what took place concerning Jesus. Again, Pilate responding in verse 12, what do you want me to do with him who call the king of the Jews, and again they cried, they shouted, crucify him. Pilate said to them, what evil, for what evil has he done? But they shouted out increasingly, crucify him. Then Pilate, having determined the appropriate action, and, and keep this in mind that Pilate is a Roman governor. These are the people of Israel. These are the Jews of Jesus' day. This is what they have called for in the regard of Jesus, and Pilate turns Jesus over to their will. As we were looking in the Gospel of John, and we have some of it here today before us, uh, Pilate even asked the question, am I a Jew? And, and I think that he said that with somewhat of a sarcasm. Uh, does, do you really think this matters to me? And Pilate is content and willing to follow the desires of the people and deliver Jesus over to be crucified. Let's go across the page now to Luke chapter 23. Pilate summoned the chief priests and the leaders of the people. He said to them, you brought me this man as one who subverted the people and see, I have examined him before you and find no grounds for the charge of which you accuse him. And neither does Herod, for I sent you before him, and behold, nothing deserving of death is committed by him. I will therefore release him after warning him, for he had a need to release unto them one of the feast day. And here's where, again, just as we have in Matthew and Mark, they cry out, release Barabbas and deliver Jesus that he might be crucified. So verse 22 so for a third time, he said to them, why, what evil has he done? I have found no cause for death in him. I will release him with a warning. But with loud shouting, they pressured him, demanding Jesus to be crucified. And their voices and those of the chief priests prevailed. And Pilate gave sentence, again, in the regard of an unconvicted man one of whom there is no proof of any wrong being done, Pilate gives sentence for Jesus to be according to their requirements, according to their demand, and he released to them he who for sedition and murder had been put in prison as they demanded, and according to their decision, Pilate delivered up Jesus. I, I hope that you're impressed I hope you're even overwhelmed this morning with how wrong this whole situation is and the, the matter of justice being set aside and that the will of the people and the wrong of sinful men prevails over the issues of law and justice, the issues of right and wrong. Now John chapter 19, just go down the page. Pilate took Jesus and scourged him, and the soldiers braided a wreath from thorns, placing it upon his head. They threw a purple robe upon him, and they said, Hail, King of the Jews, and they struck him. 
Um, how, how does something like this happen in a legal court? How does this behavior ever get by that a person, whether accused, even guilty, would be set before soldiers that would mock and ridicule him uh, as if the situation wasn't bad enough already? Now, we mentioned last week that the people, they stood outside the courtroom, likely on the street, I'm going to suggest to you, and I don't have any proof of this, Pilate came out to speak to them, and I'm going to say maybe from a balcony, uh, at least from an entrance to the courtroom, and he goes out to speak to the people in the regard of the activities of this courtroom scene. And to be very frank with you, only what takes place within the courtroom is according to legal record. And so as Pilate goes out to speak to them and then comes back in to speak to Jesus, in reality, if there was a court reporter there, none of this could have been reported because these are things that took place outside the court, the sanctity of the court. Verse four, Pilate went out again. And he told them, look, I bring him outside to you that you may know that I found no crime regarding him. And then Jesus comes outside wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said unto them, behold the man. Then when the chief priest and the subordinate officers saw him, they shouted saying, crucify, crucify. And Pilate told them, you take him and crucify him because I find no crime regarding him. And then the conversation went into other things that Pilate in reality wouldn't have cared about, but I think it spoke to his heart. I really believe that in the end, Pilate understands the injustice that has taken place here. And I can't say of any certainty, but it would appear almost that Pilate may have recognized Jesus for who he is Keep in mind that there was a lot of activity going on here, sanctioned by God, uh, even to the point that when we read of Jesus' crucifixion, one of the soldiers looks up at Jesus, having yielded up his spirit, and says, truly, this was a righteous man. Truly, this was the Son of God. So God is moving. God is revealing the truth here in this horrible, unjust situation, and in the end, there are those that are touched by the reality, by the truth of what is taking place, and I have to say this morning, has this touched your heart? Have you realized this morning from your own guilt before a holy God, have you realized what took place at Calvary and that God offered up his only begotten son as a sacrifice to atone for, to make payment for, to redeem you back from the penalty of your sin so that you can have forgiveness and salvation. I hope this moves your heart just as it moved the hearts of those. And, and these were people whose background had nothing to do with the Jewish religion and would have been totally unfamiliar even with the teachings of Jesus, and yet they see that what has happened here is so horribly wrong. And there were those that even at the sight of the crucifixion came to faith in Jesus Christ. I, I'm just going to say this, and this will come up later on as we finish out the book of Mark, but in reality, the first person to become a believer, okay? The first person to believe on Jesus after his death was a Roman soldier. We know that on the cross he spoke words of salvation to one of the two thieves that were crucified on either side of him, but then Jesus died after having said, today you'll be with me in paradise. But that Roman soldier standing at the foot of the cross looked up 
and seeing the manner by which Jesus yielded up his spirit. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. He said, truly this was a righteous man. Truly this was the Son of God. What do you say today? What is your response? What is your reaction to this horrible injustice, to this undeserved death, to this innocent man who lays himself down before God in payment for our sins? How have you responded to the crucified Christ? I want to take a look at the little portion at the bottom of the page. It says chapter 3. This is taken from the book of Acts. How well known was the activity of this trial? How well known was the outcome of this horrible deed and the crucifixion of Jesus Christ? Look at what is said in Acts chapter 3. This is within... This is within a little more than a month after Jesus dies. The God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant son, Jesus, whom you bound over and denied him in the presence of Pilate, who had determined to release him, but you denied the holy and just one. And actually, it goes on to say, and desired a murderer to be released unto you. So here we stand as witnesses today from eyewitness testimony, from the word of God that we have read from the four gospels, as well as these statements given by the apostles in those early days of the church that declare to us the same confirmation, declare to us the evidence substantiated by eyewitness testimony. What do you see here? What does this say to you? What and how is your heart affected by the activities of this innocent, the very Son of God who gives himself in our place and dies for our sins according to the Scripture? I have a big, long list of verses that we could read from the scripture uh, having to do with this, this thing of substitution, this death where one dies in making payment. Uh, we had a couple of them from Peter that we recited last week, that he was made to be sin for us who knew no sin. Your sin and mine took Jesus to the cross. People want to accuse the Roman government, they want to accuse the Jewish people, they want to accuse the rabble crowd. You and I can stand as we view these things and bow before the foot of the cross and we can say it was my sin that caused him to bleed, to suffer and die. Jesus died for me. I trust that today those words will be upon not just the lips but the heart of everyone who has heard these words about an innocent victim standing in the place of the guilty and that today you'll come to Jesus. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the word of God. We thank you for the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for his death on Calvary. We thank you that it restores us to a position that we never would have or could have had apart from the cross. And we can stand today on holy ground and can look upon this one who loved us even to death. And we can say from our hearts, Jesus died for me. We thank you that the one who we will be looking at, who was hung upon that cross, rose again from the dead, and we have a living Savior at the right hand of God today who can plead his blood on our behalf that we who were guilty can be called the sons of God and stand accepted in the beloved. We give you thanks for him, our Lord Jesus Christ, your son, in his worthy and precious name, amen. We have a response song.
And uh, it was like, okay, this is, this is a great hymn of the faith. Man of sorrows, what a name. For the Son of God who came, ruined sinners to be claimed. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Let's stand together. <laughs> Hallelujah, what a say. 